talking talking back. back. Welcome to Decision Decision Space, Space. the only show to take place right here in the space between the turns in your favorite games. I'm Brendan Hansen. I'm Jake Friedman. And this is the podcast about decisions in games. And today we're back to a deep dive review, this time covering Richard Garfield's Bunny Kingdom, a drafting game that has you doing multiplication in the endgame scoring. Let's go. Is that like the best way to sell this game? (laughs) That's the best way. We don't talk about the lovely board. We don't talk about this interesting and deep strategic decision space. We don't talk about how quick it is. We just say you got to do multiplication and it's played on a grid. Or you play it on Board Game Arena and then all that's taken care of for you. Yes, that that does work well. (laughs) Well, Brendan, before we get into this week's deep dive episode, we just want to take a quick second to plug our Patreon page uh, for those who are listening in. You may not know that Brendan and I have a Patreon page uh, linked in the description of this podcast where kind listeners, uh, our patrons have gone and supported our show financially. This has enabled us to pay for hosting the site and all the other kind of small upgrades that we've done for our patrons. So Brendan, what are we doing now that is so exciting? The really exciting thing that we're doing now is we are every week week in and week out recording the video of Jake and I recording the podcast. And we're uploading those videos unedited to the patron, our Patreon page. And we're including a special off the record, on on the record. No, on the off the record. On the off the record at the beginning of the episode. So you get sort of Jake and I's pre-show ramble about what we want to talk about, but also maybe random things in our mind or a, a little summary of what we've been playing. Jake's thoughts on his chocolate tier list and more. Excellent. So if you love this show, uh, if it brings joy to uh, your life in any way, we would really appreciate it if you would check out our Patreon and see if any of those perks interest you. And we're not asking for a lot of money. You know, a dollar a month, five dollars a month would go a tremendous way to supporting us and helping us grow. So that's the plug. And should we get into the episode? I think we should get into it. Every time we do this, we talk about our game rating and review to really contextualize our perspective on the game so you can get a better sense for our bias as we really get in and try to unpack what the game does, where it succeeds, and where it fails. But we want you to know what we think of it, sort of, so you you have a sense for our taste. So Jake, do you want to share your thoughts first? Yeah, I'll go first. So Bunny Kingdom is a game that took me a while to get over the hump of. So I really didn't enjoy my first two or three plays of the game. And then I started to like it a bit more around play four or five. Then I was really enjoying it around play six, seven, eight, nine. And I haven't felt that like enjoyment continue to go up. So I think I'm sort of in the tapering off or leveling Mm. off stage around you know i played it 13 times now and i think it's it's i'm wavering between like a six and a half and a seven that's kind of i'll give it a seven but that's sort of where i'm at with this game and really the main thing i wanted to bring up in this mini review here is just that uh my my good friend paul solomon likes to joke and says it's you know it's decision space you know the only show that takes place right here in the space between the turns of your favorite games on Board Game Arena. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Paul. <well. laughs> and I, I just have to like highlight that this is a game that I've only played on Board Game Arena. And I think that one of the downsides of this game that I can envision is that there's like a tremendous amount of like scoring upkeep that kind of happens uh, during the rounds of play. And then, you know, people talk about end game scoring being like an extra 15, 20 minutes uh, in some cases on on top of that. Uh, And that is like enough of a downside to me that this is like one of the few games that I feel like I do enjoy it enough on board game arena, but I'm really not interested in playing it at the table. So that also just like knowing that kind of makes me want to drop my review or my rating down a little bit. So I'll leave it there. Really quickly, Jake, do you feel like would you say you like drafting games, you're neutral in drafting games, or you're biased against drafting games? I think my bias is against drafting games. Okay. Yeah, I've talked about this on the show before where I loved drafting Magic the Gathering growing up. That was like mm-hmm. my limited, it was always my absolute favorite format. I would do two, you know, I'd often go to the local game store twice a week on Wednesdays and Saturdays just to do um, magic drafts. So for me, like the draft always felt like kind of like the the prelude to like the really fun game playing. Um, so then getting into modern board games and being introduced to sort of 
uh, draft style games. Sometimes I feel like I'm just left wanting more out of them, like just like a more of a game experience. So that's just a personal bias that uh, I can carry with me going into these games. I, they're, I, they're games that I feel like I, I can appreciate more than they're ones that like I tend to want to like go back to over and over again. Yeah. Awesome. Okay. Here's my thoughts on Bunny Kingdom. Bunny Kingdom is a connoisseur's gem. Most drafting games require repeat plays to fully appreciate, and Bunny Kingdom is a prime example of this. But if players can stick it out and stomach the game's somewhat mathematical edges, drafting spaces on a 10 by 10 grid, multiplication-based scoring, they're in for a real treat. Bunny Kingdom offers a rich and nuanced strategic web, engaging decisions bolstered by awesomely fuzzing fuzzy scoring outcomes, and just enough interaction to link the players at the table into a shared experience. Bunny Kingdom isn't perfect, but it's a delight. Eight and a half out of ten. And I've played this game um, all on Board Game Arena as well. Uh, I have played it 47 times, though. Okay, awesome. Would you want to play it on the table? Yes, absolutely. (laughs) If I could play it with a group of other people, I'm not seeking out Bunny Kingdom because now that I've played it 47 times, I think in inherent problem with a lot of drafting games is the learning curve that we talked about. Mm -hmm. So I don't know that I would want to buy Bunny Kingdom and then subject, say, Maya and a friend who came over to playing it with me because but if I could go if I could play at a convention with either the base game or add in the expansion. Yes, I'm I'm all about it. That truly is like the board game arena curse or same with Yukata. Uh, where it's just like I find a new game and I just like absolutely love it, and then I'm just like, oh great, now I like can't actually can't this like anymore. enjoy <laughs> this with my friends. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> this is true. I want to talk about the game background a little bit, yeah, because Bunny Kingdom I think is an interest has an interesting design history. I did some uh, reading of interviews, which I like to do whenever there's the opportunity. And luckily, when you're covering a game by a famous designer, that's often more common. Richard Garfield is the designer of Bunny Kingdom, but also, of course, uh, maybe more well known for his work on card games like Magic the Gathering. Or You think more well known for that? I, I, I feel like slightly. <laughs> Netrunner, uh, also King of Tokyo, Keyforge. Um, but I also wanted to note that so Bunny Kingdom came out in 2017 from Yellow and then got an expansion in 2019 that Jake and I are not going to talk about today at all called besides this called Bunny Kingdom in the Sky. Um, but this game came out sort of in the middle of a really a trilogy of drafting games by Richard Garfield that in some of the interviews I read, he sort of said they all came out of this same sort of desire to explore drafting games, which he says was happening before Seven Wonders came out for him. Uh, But his were just a little bit slower to get published. So in 2015, a game called Treasure Hunter came out from Richard Garfield that was published by Queen Games. And then in 2017, there was Bunny Kingdom. And then there was Carnival of Monsters, which is one that I've heard a little bit of chatter about. But it seems to be that people tend to prefer Bunny Kingdom or Treasure Hunters, Treasure Hunter to Carnival of Monsters. Jake, you've played Treasure Hunter? Yeah, I got Treasure Hunter on like a phone app. And okay. the app, so I only played against AI opponents on there because... I don't know if anybody else is on the apps. I tried searching for opponents one time and I don't think anybody else was playing it. I have no idea uh, if you can still get it for a buck on Android or whatever it was, but it's a really cool game. That one that I tried to get us to play at the last Geekway because it's one I think that you would really dig. Uh, So I recommend, especially for you, Brendan, that you seek that one out and give it a play or maybe just check the app store. Yeah, I would I would love to play that one. That's one I've been interested in for a long time. And it's another pretty straightforward drafting game. Bunny Kingdom kind of there's no board in that game, right? Yeah, it's and it's honestly like I don't feel qualified to talk about it sure, much. Sure, it's been a long time. Uh just because it's been a long time since I've played it, I wasn't prepared. But yeah, I've, I think people were like I feel like it was a drafting game with maybe like a little bit of like Fox in the Forest or something like there's different rewards you could go for. And maybe it's like if you get like the highest hand, you can get some kind of reward. But then if other people are going high, then you can maybe go low or cancel. Cool. There's some some really interesting like ways that you're interacting with the hands that people are drafting. Awesome. Okay, Jake, can I read you an excerpt from one of the interviews that I read? And then we'll kind of move on just because I think it's really interesting for people who like Bunny Kingdom. So this is... You, you don't want me to talk more about a game that I don't really remember how it goes? I, can, I mean, I, frankly, if we weren't on the air, absolutely. <laughs> just make up, make up how yeah. Treasure Hunter works in its entirety. So many people are just scratching their heads right now. For the on the record, off the record, next week, yeah. you can okay. do that. Yeah, yeah. 
for our patrons. But more I'll recollections that- from one exactly. time with an app. Yeah. Yeah. Perfect. That's the kind of content that's premium on our show. So Richard Garfield was asked what changed in from the original design of this game uh, to to the published version that became Bunny Kingdom. So Richard says, Bunny Kingdom was originally called Dwarven Dwarven Roads. It was taken by a a publisher who did not print it for two years, after which Seven Wonders came out, and they felt that drafting games were done. I still believed in Dwarven Roads, however, and when I showed it to Yellow, they agreed to publish it. The biggest change to the game in the intervening years has been the flavor. I think that's so interesting. Which went several ways before we ended up with Paul... Mayfion's Beautiful Bunnies. And I think the art is very charming in this game. Uh, It was even an ant colony at one point. I would say choosing the theme was the most difficult part of the publishing process, and it took a long time before everyone was on board with the theme. Mechanically, the game got a little simpler in a variety of ways. Drafting two cards a turn rather than one, for example, sped the game up and made it a lot easier to draft cards that go together and make combos. And at first, I thought this I thought of this change just as a rule for beginners, but quickly found I just found the game more fun that way. So I thought that was really interesting. Also, Richard in these interviews re- uh, reveals that when he plays Bunny Kingdom, he likes to just draft all the parchments and overextend himself such that he doesn't score enough points off them. And then watches everyone else get big empire, big fifes and feel bad about it. Uh, and then he says... I want to just mention this because we both mentioned this in our in our mini reviews at the start of the show. Richard says that he thinks the multiplication is not a big deal and people make too big of a deal of it, but he thinks the tabulation of adding together all the parchments is actually what really is burdensome and was something that he felt was necessary but sort of frustrating about the design in a way, using the word burdensome himself. Yeah, okay, sure, fair enough. Cool. That's mostly what I want to talk about. If you're a patron, there's also a cool excerpt that I found about Richard Garfield's aspiring advice for game designers that you could check out in the show notes that we share with all of our patrons as well. But I'll give you the (laughs) the really quick, the quick spark notes, which is Richard thinks you should play lots of games and even games you don't care about at all or that you think aren't for you. Yeah. Yeah. Like every game covered on the Decision Space podcast, which is true in, you know, so many, so often when we cover a game just from a treetop view, one of us will start off not liking it and then grow to enjoy the game as you understand it more. Yeah. Uh, I find that it's just really hard to enjoy a game that you don't really under, at least for me, that I don't understand yeah. kind of what it's trying to do, what I should be trying to do. Uh, and, and most of these games, especially ones that have been, you know, tested by, so many consumers and kind of like rise up to the general hive mind the radars like there's something cool under the hood there uh so if you don't get it at the start it's probably just a few plays away Uh, totally i will also say jake that publisher who didn't who took dwarven roads for two years and then ended up not publishing it because seven wonders came out and they decided that drafting games were done on one hand it sounds so silly right obviously there have been drafting games that have done quite well since seven wonders came out games like i i I imagine i don't know if sushi go came out after seven wonders but that's that's another example i think so yeah it's a wonderful world is another drafting game that people seem to really like bunny kingdom in its own right has done quite well but i will say perhaps blood rage a huge drafting game but i think you know in the intervening years drafting games have tapered off a little bit just for this what we've kind of been dancing around this idea that maybe games sort of the modern market wants to have games that are outstanding on their first play and leave a rock solid impression. And that's a huge hill to climb for a lot of drafting games where you really need to know and understand the card pool to make interesting decisions. And that takes a few plays because typically the group isn't going to sit down and say, okay, let's study all these cards and really understand the strategic framework here before we play. Right. That's not that's not fun. Yeah. Right. Similar uh, to what we were talking about with the auction games. At the same time, I do think there's sort of like a first to it factor where like the first game that kind of really does a kind of novel mechanism well tends to be smash mega hits, right? Like Seven Wonders or Dominions or Agricola or whatever, you know, but that doesn't mean those mechanisms are dead if you're just kind of like comparing all games to the sort of originator of the genre. Totally. Work replacement's dead to me since Agricola, by the way. Yeah, which wasn't the first. I'm just joking. <laughs> a lot of people <laughs> probably think that. <laughs> Roll and write played out. There's never been one nearly as big as Yahtzee. This is true. This is true. All right, Brendan, should we jump into the rules overview and then meet back on the other side for our deep dive discussion? Absolutely. Absolutely. 
Bunny Kingdom is a card drafting game for two to four players, played over the course of four rounds. Each round, players are dealt a hand of cards, and simultaneously, every player at the table picks two cards to draft from that hand of cards and then passes the whole hand to their neighbor. While players draft cards, they're drafting cards to develop territories of adjacent spaces on a 10x10 grid on a shared board. The spaces on this grid depict different types of terrain, some with resources like wood, carrots, and fish, and others with cities. At the end of each round, players score points for each territory of contiguous spaces in their color on this grid, and these contiguous spaces of each territory are called fiefs in the language of the game, and they score points equal to the value of cities in each of their fiefs, uh, cities range in value from 1 to 3, multiplied by the number of unique resources in that fife. While players draft territory cards to expand their fifes on the board, they may also draft endgame scoring objective cards called parchments. Cards showing unique luxury resources that must be played in specific train types. For example, diamonds must be played into a mountain space the player controls, pearls must be played into a water space, and so on. Or they can draft treasure cards, which grant a set amount of endgame points. They can also draft city cards, which allow them to add new cities to the board into their fifes at round end to a space that they control so long as it doesn't already contain another city or a resource like a luxury good that they've added to them. At the end of the game, the player with the most points taking into account the points they scored for their fifes at the end of each round, and their parchments, representing their endgame scoring conditions, is crowned the victor. Okay, Brendan, thank you so much for doing uh, a very standard job with the rules overview. Hopefully it gives people a better sense of how to play the game. Just kidding. It was a really good job. I really appreciate it. <laughs> Thank you, Jake. Okay, we get to characterize the decision space now. So this is where we talk about things like size and depth, the type of decision space, the feel, um, the clarity. And Jake, you mentioned wanting to maybe talk about scoring logistics here, which I think we've touched on a little bit, but would certainly be relevant to this discussion. Yeah, absolutely. But let's let's save that for the end, perhaps. Okay, let's do that. So let's talk about the size and depth. Does that work for you? I think that's like an interestingly, like there's... There's really interesting decisions to chew on here, but it's certainly not massive, right? The card pool, you can wrap your head around by, you said you were starting to have fun by play th two, three, or four. And I think yeah. that that's about how long it takes to wrap your head around the card pool here, which is a testament to the fact that once you've played the game around 10 times, you really have a, a strong sense for sort of strategically everything that's going on in the game. And I think that there there is room for drafting games that have even more going on than this. I think you could have a larger card pool. You could have more me mechanisms going on. So I sort of see this as sort of a, a medium-sized decision space in terms of the game overall uh, and the strategic variance that it offers, but a, but a fairly deep one because I think the strategic web that Richard Garfield's designed here is actually awesome. And it's something that should be studied and really interesting. And I think that if someone was looking for a way to make an interesting strategic web for a game, this would be an, a great case study. And I'm excited to talk about why I think that more in the episode. And like big shocker that like the person who designed the color pie in Magic the Gathering, which has carried the game for 30 years, can make a nice, interesting strategic decision space. Yeah, that's interesting. Uh, I'm excited to hear you talk more about why uh, you think it is so deep, because my gut reaction is almost inverse of you. Like, I feel like the decision space is you know pretty large just from the size just from the sheer number of cards sheer numbers of decisions you're making mm. in a lot of drafting games i think especially more modern drafting games have kind of gone out of their way to limit the size of the decision space by either just having like a really confined number of cards you're looking at like something in inish or just mm. the number of cards you're dealt to start you know maybe you're only getting uh, hand I don't I can't remember what I was playing recently but it's like you get like six cards or something at the start of your turn so you can only see like one again so those things are limiting the size of the decision space and that's not the case here where you get how big is your starting hand in it depends on player count but usually like 12 cards or so yeah 10 or 12 cards that's yeah. a that's a big hand to, to, you know it's like almost like a full pack of magic the gathering that you're looking through to like consume the information um and that means you're just going around the table many times uh so you'll be drafting a bunch of cards but the depth for me has not seemed that great i think just because maybe i've kind of got into a rut of play style where i sort of mm. like kind of decide pretty early on on what i'm going for and then once i've picked that out i've found it pretty straightforward a lot of the time to pick the cards that most further that strategy whatever it is so mm. i felt 
there were like some pretty major stair steps in my understanding of the game. First was just learning the cards. Uh, and I needed to do that to be able to really appreciate the game at all. Yeah. Because I before that, I just didn't feel like I was able to make any kind of decisions. Like, what are the cards and how do they work? Uh, that was level one. Then level two was like, okay, now I know what these cards do and I can like create a strategy and go for it. And then level three is like, now I'm actually starting to like care about what other people are doing too uh, sure. and start thinking through like, okay, which of these cards actually might be more likely to make it around the table to me? And I know there's a ton of nuance there. I think almost any uh, games as strategically complex as this uh, with, you know, player a lot of uh, player agency impacting the decision space is going to be kind of like infinitely deep to a certain extent. Like if you the more you want to study it, I, I'm sure that this becomes an incredibly high skill testing game. But my experience playing it was not that like, wow, this decision space is really deep. It was actually felt kind of shallow. Interesting. You so you feel by by what point in the game do you feel like you're kind of like railroaded down your path? And is railroaded well, the right word for your railroad is of... not the right word. Okay. But I feel <laughs> like you're gonna think I'm an idiot, but like pick one? That, like pick like three or four. Like by the okay, time so I'm like four uh, cards in? Six uh, cards uh, in? Uh, like, like like maybe like but by the time I've seen my like third hand. I feel wow. like I'm usually pretty settled on the, uh, the big overarching strategy, which would be like going big on parchments, uh, okay. going big on on fives, or like kind of a hybrid between the two. Okay, so that's <laughs> like, so interesting. We just we have to get into this right now. Okay, so okay. so name name the strategic paths that you see in the game, and then I'll name some that I see in the game. Okay, a strategic path that I see in the game is just maximizing your five scoring sure. by rounds. And you're going like, to do that by, by lots collect, of cities yeah, and lots getting, of unique resources, including luxury goods. Right. Yes. So you're drafting, re, you're drafting territories, cities, and luxury goods. Okay. Correct. What else? Big parchment strategy. So that's like where you, you know, Richard Garfield's favorite, where you're focusing on getting a lot of parchment cards, uh, and you don't need to score as many points per round by five because you're going to score so many points at the end of the game based on the parchments that you're picking up. Do you feel like you have to do this by getting the bureaucrat, which gives you one point for every parchment you have, or no, by getting the so. treasure hunter or treasure I guardian? Think the, is is the treasure hunter the one that gives you like three points for every treasure card you get? Yeah, something like that. That or one is the, that one seems pretty. I mean, I think these all help. Like the more okay. you get, the better. You feel like you can just draft parchment cards and have a viable shot at winning the game. I mean, I played the game thirteen times. I hear I've you. Won, I hear you. I just I've asking. won three times, and at least one of those wins was doing exactly that. I think the most okay. recent one. Okay. Um, and I mean, I did note in that game that nobody was scoring a lot of points during the rounds because I think a lot of the unique resource luxury cards goods. Yeah. luxury goods weren't coming out early mm. so that really is sort of like going to hamstring people that were like oh i'm gonna be trying to like connect big fives yeah okay what else and then i think the, yeah i think those are like two and then definitely i think there's a path in the middle uh and what i've seen work most successfully for me is like being like 75 80 percent fives but then like having one or two two sure. parchments that kind of fuel it like you're uh, building so, around carrot king and you're trying exactly, to push towards like the carrot farms or exactly right yeah, yeah carrot or the forest or the fishmonger sure i think those are kind of yeah i mean it feels like i you know find a powerful parchment pretty early on and i just push in that direction or i you know get off to like a hot start with fifes meaning like uh, already in the first round i'm scoring like six eight ten points or something sure and ten i'm points just like all right you. let's go i'm just gonna keep adding to that if i can okay that i think okay so that's so interesting so here's how i see bunny kingdom strategically i agree that sort of there's like these three overarching strategic paths that are like the core strategic foundation the bedrock on which the game is built right fifes which are really important that's like your territories that you're claiming on the board that you're trying to get cities and unique resources then there's treasure. I think treasure is a legitimate strategic path that you can go into. So treasure are the cards in the game that give you flat amounts of points, but there's the treasure guardian and the treasure hunter. One of those doubles the amount that each of the treasure are worth. And one of them gives you three points for every treasure that you have. I think that if you, if you open those cards early, especially both of them, you can just go hard on treasure. And then 
either kind of lean towards more parchment, like you're saying, Jake, by picking up some of the other parchment scoring cards. Uh, great if you get a bureaucrat because uh, all the treasure cards are parchment cards too. Or there's also sort of strategies built around parchments. I haven't had a lot of success just like ignoring territories and kind of just drafting the parchments and then winning. I think that you oftentimes have to thoughtfully draft the parchments and then kind of build towards them. And you kind of have these cards that end up being a little bit of like build around parchments that if you open them early, you can push that strategic direction. But I don't see it as sort of a, this like catch all. I think the parchment cards are sort of the glue of the game that brings some of the other strategic paths together. And then the big city path is sort of a path where, yeah, I mean, I mean, ideally you'd love to get fifes and just get one of every resource in the game and then just draft cities. Boom, you're going to score a million points. But I think oftentimes in reality, you're sort of playing a, I'm playing an edge of the board wood strategy because that's kind of the strategy that I, I ended up in because there's the the parchment card that gives me points, one point for every resource I have on the edge of the board. Maybe I start on the left side of the board where there's lots of wood and then I try to stack the wood the wood parchments. Or maybe I'm playing, I, I crack some mountains early and I get the master of mountains and I say, okay, I'm going to try to build these little fifes all over the board where I snatch up all the mountains and then just try to hope that I can open the luxury goods and I move the gold and the diamonds up in my pick order and then try to build these small but mighty fifes. And maybe ideally, I also get the little prince that lets me score both my biggest and my second biggest as well. So I think that for me, I don't see it as sort of three or two sort of overarching things. I see it as efficiency puzzles, especially because with the cities, when you're going for a big ter- empire slash territory, there's a huge question of how much territory do I need? Because you, there's a huge potential in this game to take cards that end up being worthless to you because of the way that the scoring of the empires works at the end of the game or the fifes, right? It's the number of unique resources multiplied by the number of cities. So oftentimes I feel like, especially when I was learning in this game, I would draft a ton of territory onto the board that then didn't really accomplish much. I had just picked a bunch of spaces that then I claimed that other people didn't get, but it wasn't giving me more points. So it was a missed opportunity where I could have been drafting parchment. So what I love about the strategic path is it's sort of always forcing you to be like, do you really need that? It's asking you the like the question of, yeah, you could take this space that's another carrot, but you already have a carrot in that fife and maybe it will one day connect you up to a mountain, but will that mountain pay off? Are you going to get a three city that goes in the mountain or a luxury resource? And I think it's, it's constantly demanding you to say, to speculate on where your points will come. And I think that plays into the shared board really nicely. And yeah, now I'm just talking about how much I like Money Kingdom. Yeah, I mean, I hear everything you're saying and I actually think we see the game similarly. We're just kind of stating it differently. Okay, interesting. I, I Because like, yeah. Like At the end of the day, of, you're sort of, yeah. Yeah, like edge of the board wood strategy is a strategy that I've played in, in one of the games in a recent one or whatever. But that's because like, I got the parchment card early on, right? And like the first sure. pack that was like, okay, all the territories on the edge of the board score you a point. Um, yeah. So then I started taking them. You know, it, it. I think it's like a good, I don't think you would do well in this game forcing any strategy. Like if you, no, all today definitely. I'm going to be going for fifes no matter what, because I think that getting a big city is really strong. That's not going to work out for you. And that's definitely not what I'm saying. Like the game definitely, you have to let the game kind of fall to you based on what's showing up. Uh, and, and hopefully those things continue to show up because maybe the person to your left is is in some other strategy. I think what for me is so interesting, Jake, is I think what you just said is true of almost all drafting games, right? Like you have to stay open and you have to draft what your seat is spo- supposed to be drafting. They're not the type of game where you can go in and say, my favorite strategy to play in this game is X, so I'm going to play that strategy. You have to play where whatever your seat, the cards that are coming to you is what kind of was the best thing to be picking. But... Mm-hmm. I feel like in Bunny Kingdom, there's more varied and more nuanced payoffs for all of the cards in the game, whether they're territories or luxury goods or parchments, compared to a lot of the other drafting games I've played, like say Seven Wonders, where if I, you know, I just have a a sort of tier list for cards in that game where I know, okay, if I open this, the Caravansary early in the Second Age, I'm going to take that card because it's really good. And it maybe yeah. it varies by the wonder I'm playing, but I think in Bunny Kingdom, because all the cards are just sort of mashed into one giant card pool and they can come up kind of whenever, the 
types of decisions that you're making and the amount that a card can be worth can just vary in such an interesting way that it's super fuzzy compared to a lot of drafting games for me. Though I hear what you're saying. Like once you're kind of committed, you you can't pivot your strategy too hard. You can't pivot. Yeah. And I think that's sort of like where the game feels more like prescriptive maybe mm-hmm. is that yes, you're staying open, you're trying to solve this efficiency puzzle, but it feels kind of like solvable on each mm. turn, right? You kind of start in a strategy and you're like, okay, this is good because like it fits in my strategy. So I'm like, keep taking those cards or like nothing is good for me here. So I'm going to take a different parchment or like, you know, take a luxury resource because maybe I'll use that later. And that changes the math to you so that when I'm looking at my next pack, like, oh, maybe now all of a sudden these, this other card is more efficient than what I would have taken had that previous pick not happened. But I don't, feel like if it always kind of feels to to me like the game is kind of like happening to you in a sense like i don't Mm. feel like i have a tremendous amount of like agency i guess i don't know agency doesn't really feel like the right word you know of like yeah i took the carrot farmer and grabbed a bunch of carrots like i really made that happen (laughs) sure i feel like for me and i'm curious what you think some of the most interesting decisions in this games are is sort of you know, you're halfway through pack one or pack two, and you're presented this opportunity of you can expand your territory, but you don't, you're not wheeling a slam, you're not opening a slam dunk card. So it's not a card where it's just an obvious addition to your fife. It's maybe two or three spaces away, and it's a new resource, or it's a mountain, or something that, or a city that could be really beneficial if you could get it connected. But the question is, could you get it connected versus, say, a one value city or a two value city? Um, or a parchment that's just going to pay a few points off and trying to compare which way to go. I feel there for me, there's often interesting decisions where I'm trying to think through what other players sort of around me are doing, assess the level of risk I want to take on given if I'm losing, um, yeah. if I need to kind of make a big comeback happen. I think it presents in more interesting decisions than a lot of drafting games that I've played. And because you're picking two cards, you can kind of push the strategic gas pedal in a certain direction a little harder mid pack than you might otherwise if you can open a cool a cool pair of cards yeah for sure yeah i mean they're definitely i I don't want to say that uh every single pick in this game is like easy or obvious there's definitely tough ones uh and i'm you know and i'm certain too that a more skilled player is making far better decisions than i am uh but even then i think like in that example we just picked like if you have some sense of where you how your game is going so far you know that can maybe draw you to the correct line like i should take a higher risk line here that's really going to pay off big because i feel like it's not coming together for me so far versus yeah oh yeah like everything is kind of going well i'm going to take you know just like a smaller increment and i was looking before i played all my games and it seems like there's a, a pretty like there there's some games that seem lower scoring overall yeah. Uh, but most games, it feels like the top score is like between 150 and 160. Yeah. Uh, so if you can kind of like try, not that this would be easy to like look ahead and see like, are you, is that in the cards for you? If you take this conservative play, that might be a way to kind of like help cut through some of that fog. Yeah. How often do you pass luxury goods? Like the mushroom or the diamond or the gold or the pearl? Uh, I, I think pretty often. Oh my gosh. <laughs> <laughs> is that the wrong answer? I don't no, I don't know. I I just think for me increasingly those feel like some of the high the most valuable cards in the game. Be, but it depends, right? If you start on this big parchment strategy and you you don't have a lot of cities to to kind of combo off them, they're not worth a ton of points, right? They're worth as much as the number of cities in any fight that you have. So if you if you there it it just depends, you know? Yeah. I should say all of my games have been at four players. Okay. Um so perhaps i mean or obviously the game would change a lot at two players being like so zero sum see there's actually a variant too okay it's funky uh, um but yeah so i haven't been playing any like i've been doing very little hate drafting Mm. uh, unless it's just something that's like obviously good for that territory is going to get richard 25 points i have for the person who's like going right after me which i think is the way i always play in drafting games like i i'll always like make the next person <laughs> do the hate draft do the hate if drafting I can. For you. Yeah. Because then it's like, hey, both of them are getting hurt. That's a bigger net win for me. Yeah. But yeah, I think it's so I was gonna say for the 
feel of this game uh, so it's interesting you brought up specific cards that like the overall feel i have is that like the game is incredibly balanced like if mm. i play yeah. the cards in a vacuum like you can hardly like shine a light between them yeah i think maybe is something that leads in a little bit to my current feeling like the game is kind of happening to me like i don't have a lot of agency which i don't feel as much in a game like magic where it's like oh i can actually like impose myself on the game a little bit more because i have like knowledge and thoughts about what is good uh in this format perhaps better or or worse than somebody else in the game yeah i mean it's really interesting because i think when you look at the math too it depends on when you open the luxury goods obviously the earlier you get them in the game the more potential payoff they're going to be if you get the cities to support them versus cards like, I mean, ideally the cards that score you 20 points for giving you certain a certain set of resources. I kind of just want to wheel that card pretty late in a pack and then get it when I'm sort of halfway towards being able to do it, then know that I can still ultimately accomplish it and not give up a lot of opportunity to pursue it otherwise. Yeah. I do think there's some cards that are just objectively so good that I almost always take them early. Like the card Jake, I think it's liberal and socialist. They let yeah. you copy parchments to your left and right. Those almost always odd. pay off 10 or 12 points at the end of the game. And that's like just, six minimum almost. Oh yeah. They're just so which good. Is, which is like a really good value. Yeah. I almost I feel really like, pass them. Yeah. If you're scoring like three to four points in a card, I think that's really solid at sure. almost at any point in the game. So uh, expected value that's almost like two times that is yeah. pretty nuts. So how, I mean, the city cards, right? Let's say you have three resources, taking a two city pays off six points. Wait, yeah, yeah, but but there's more of a downside there, which is like, that's like uh, taking up one of your territory spaces yeah. where the parchment just sits there. Like, you don't right. have to give up anything else at all. Yeah. Like the opportunity to place something else. Yeah. Okay, wait. I feel like the fact that we're, we've spent most of this episode so far trying to get through just even the characterizing, but then getting stuck in strategic conversation is in one part me taking us off track constantly. Yeah. I'll, yeah, I'll agree you that. Fault. But also a testament maybe to the to how nuanced it is. Yeah. You didn't even talk about... Yeah. No, finish. Oh, no, no, no. Because I was going to move us towards the type, and I think you had a good point to make. So I want to hear your point. I was just going to say, like, where I think a lot of the strategic skill in this game is, like, in predicting what is going to come back to you and not, yeah. right? I feel right. like that is where probably my suspicion good players are separating themselves is, like, both of these cards are good for me. Or perhaps, like, card B is even better, more important for me to get than card A, but it has, like, a much higher likelihood of coming back around based on you know the position of the board and the players around me uh so i'll i'll you know take that risk and i think yeah. that's something that like i'm only starting to do and i'm certain that like good players are are lapping me at that i would say, i will say so bunny kingdom's interesting right because you always draft two cards so the amount of opportunity for cards to wheel is just slightly lower than some other drafting games where you're drafting one card and maybe a pack goes around the table twice because often, you know, packs usually make it around the table once. So it's like two packs usually that you're seeing twice. And by packs, right. Jake and I mean like a hand of cards that's dealt to the players at the start of a turn. But with Bunny Kingdom, the cool thing that I think makes that, and we call that when a card comes back to you, wheeling. A cool thing that makes the wheeling decisions when you first see a pack of cards and thinking through what's going to come back. That's I agree. That's like one of my favorite parts of Bunny Kingdom is oftentimes in packs two and three, you have a lot of information that you've been staring at for a long time because you're drafting spaces on a shared board that's showing you territories and it's also showing you resources all in the center of the table. And a lot of other drafting games that I've played, like Seven Wonders, a lot of times the cards are in someone's personal play space right in front of them. Um, and in Seven Wonders, you might be playing with four, five, six, seven People, I don't recommend playing Seven Wonders with seven people, actually. But it could theoretically happen to you. And it's much more difficult to see what someone else wants, what they're going for, what would be beneficial to them, because they're collecting these cards in a personal play space, whereas Bunny Kingdom puts it all in the center of the table, more or less. The parchments stay in front of you. But I, I feel like the design synergy between it being a drafting game and having the shared board that everyone's referencing and looking at and putting things on really helps the decision space and makes thinking through what other people might take more interesting, which makes the wheeling a little bit more interesting and thinking through those decisions. So I love yeah. that about this game. I, I think that's so cool. And I hadn't thought about that until uh, Benjamin mentioned that in our discord 
uh, just like the the way that the board gives you like a visual representation of the cards that are left in the deck is so prob- cool. It's so cool. And that's just, you know, we've talked about that maybe ad nauseum about that's just such a difficult part of the learning curve of drafting games where it's like, you can't really engage with the game in a meaningful way until you have significant knowledge of the things that are possible in the deck and the cards yeah. in the deck. Uh, and, you know, by just having the drafting spaces on a 10 by 10 grid, it just like cuts through that for like, I don't know, 75% of the deck, right? The rest yep. are just these parchment cards, which are important, which are helpful to learn for sure uh, and needed to learn. But it's not like learning, you know, 150 cards. It's just the 50. Yeah. And, you know, that goes for the spaces that are there, but it also goes for things like the luxury goods, right? Where you could say, is the diamond on the board yet? No? Okay. There's still a chance I could open it. Right. Yeah. So it's so good. And thank you for mentioning that, Benjamin. I agreed. It's it's incredibly elegant that it is implemented that way. So, Brendan, let's so we talked about the size and depth. We have not the, the type. It's this waning. is a waning. We can yeah. just boom. it gets smaller in the course of the game. No it's smaller question. in the rounds and also the course of the game. Again, beautifully represented by the board. Yeah. The feel is to me, I was kind of talked a lot about that, about how I feel like the game is kind of like happening to me mm. and the clarity. We talked about that as well. So should we talk about scoring logistics? Yeah, I think we should. Can I just emphasize again, super fuzzy, not a clear decision space for me. You think it's a little bit more clear. Okay. Scoring logistics. Yeah. So on one hand, the multiplication is sort of like, I, it's, I think it's a tough sell. Which and is we're silly also because talking about this like without really good knowledge because t- the but we're playing on board game arena where it's literally just like it does instant and I have to say like it makes the game more exciting because it's yeah. like okay oh we're like almost done and I'm just like and then you just like instantly find out kind of like what happened yeah I yeah I, I okay personally Jake I feel that the learning hump of I have to do multiplication to score a game is greater than the actual burden of doing the multiplication, right? Because like everyone who you would probably want to play Bunny Kingdom with can do the multiplication of of 10 times three. It's yeah. not, that's not tough, but it, it yeah. is annoying. I, I don't really care Richard. about the multiplication as much as like the parchments. No, I don't care about the parchment. Like, I guess it it's like the visual representation of it seems mm. like hard to like see right yeah right just okay. at a glance like that it's not that like i guess i can multiply five times three that's not hard for me i'm actually like pretty good at that 15 yeah boom don't don't check my math <laughs> <laughs> but like the the way the board kind of fleshes out you know to look at an individual five try and like see how many different resources are there how many different castles are there and is then, there a sky like, tower that's connecting? Is there a to... sky tower connecting that? And then like going to the, like, how do you even go around it? Like, are you going, like each person is kind of like doing their own. They'd have to do it kind of one at a time, maybe. Uh, or you're just kind of just taking everybody's word for it, which it could just seem like kind of weird at the table because it's something that could easily be mistakenly messed up. You could like, oh, wait, am I accidentally counting something twice? Right? It, like, it just feels like my assumption would be that it's not the actual math, it's the like getting to the math. That would be a bit of a bear. And I think cards like for me, the sort of another element is cards like Bunchy. Bunchy is the one that gives you one point for every city you have that's not in a space that also right. grants resources. So yeah. this is a okay, hundred so by hundred cards. <laughs> yeah. Right. Because you're looking at a hundred by hundred grid and you're trying yeah. to find every space that you have a bunny on and you know, some boards this might be trivially easy but on some where you're really you're all kind of drafting each other's cards and you made the board a swiss cheese of fifes looking for yours trying to count them all what do you okay so you go like row by row okay i got one here one here one here it, you could miss and it's it's a little cumbersome and then there's some timing considerations with this game too um just in terms of the cards like the opportunist where okay let's see who the final scoring is okay is who's in second do they have the opportunist card okay actually they get 10 additional points and i think that parchment is really cool richard garfield actually says that's his favorite parchment Uh, and i think it's fun because it leads it could lead to a really climactic end game where the player who's in second ends up winning the game because they drafted this card worth 10 points if they end up at second or whatever it's just a fun little game design twist yeah it's a weird design it's a weird it's so strange i i i think like probably people click on this episode 
for decision space podcast to talk about is wondering what we think of this card. Okay, so, okay. <laughs> I think let's explain it completely. It. Okay. Yeah. So this is a card. The rules text says it's called the opportunist. And if you are in second place at the end of the game after all scoring has been done, you get 10 additional points. And then if you have the most points, you win. What do you think of this design, Jake? I mean, I think it's interesting. I will I'll say that. I would not want this to exist. I think I like it here, but almost because it doesn't exist in any other game. Like this is not something I would want to be like a regular part of board game scoring where you yeah. get to the end of the game and then everybody has to like, oh, did the winner really win? You know, I don't think that to me is fun. It, but, it also like, as a novel thing, it is fun. And it's interesting because it, as a game design mechanism says to the players, you should care who gets second and you should care who gets third and you should care who gets fourth, not just who wins functionally. Right. Because why do you care who gets fourth? Why would you care who loses? <laughs> Yeah, why, is, what? why does it matter? I don't because understand how this card makes third and fourth place scoring matter more. Because this card says if this card says if you only care about who wins the game, this card's pretty good, right? Because but if you care if you're gonna get if you're gonna be in fourth place or third I place, see, I see this card is less is is actually it matters more because you could be making a decision between seven flat points or ten points if you're in second. Is it better to take the seven plat points or the 10 points if you're in second? If you only care about winning, you should never take the seven the seven flat points. You yeah. should always take this card. That's but if interesting. You, yeah. Because my orientation is like, if you ain't first or last, and sure. that's made the decision around this card pretty easy, which is, take almost, the card. Like, which is almost like a snap pick sure, really early. Points. There, unless there's just something else that's like much better because yeah. I just like true rightly or wrongly, I'm just going to assume I'm going to be in first or second place at the end of the game. Uh, and if I'm in like one of those positions, I want to be in position of this card. Totally. And I think that that's, that's kind of an interesting gauntlet that or a left or right glove uh, to make a bunny kingdom reference that Richard Garfield has thrown down. Right. Because for you, it doesn't matter, but I think there's some groups where that's a more interesting decision, but it depends on what the players are bringing to the table and if they care on if you know it's if- also like what it richard garfield talked about like the thing that they worked on a lot was like the flavor of the yeah, game yeah and this card is conveying a lot about flavor to the players because this is like a euro like a purely euro drafting game right not a lot of conflict yeah no not i mean you can't take over any territories i would yeah. say no conflict right no or, you, conflict. or like the camps i guess but that's like kind of an edge Hardly. case yeah, but you come to the end of the game, and then somebody flips this up at the last second. It's like actually, I won. It's like that is not the type of like feeling or emotion that you typically get in a standard Euro drafting game. Totally, no, totally. Also, those camp cards. Can we talk about them for a second? Yeah, I think. So wait, cards- wait, wait, wait. Before we get yeah. to camp, I was like, okay. what's your final thought? Like, you like the opportunist? Do you think this type of mechanism should be? more common in no i don't i don't think it should be more common i think it's i think it's like i think that's telling (laughs) i think it's fine but it's annoying because i think the fact that we could sit down at the table and jake you could care if all you care about is if you win and i could care about if i get second or third i we're we're at odds about what our what our our magic circle is in a crisis, just even moderately. And it's yeah. kind of annoying to me. Like we can still play and enjoy the game, right? I'm, I'm overstating by calling it a crisis, but I think it a little bit for it, 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 it assumes players are coming at it with a certain mindset that they might not have. But yeah, I like it here. He's the he, Richard's great at designing random stuff that works it's, pretty well in a game. Totally. Yeah. Yeah. This is like the perfect, like, I feel like it's like the perfect, like game design example of like, do as I like, you, like do, do as, not as I say. Exactly. As I say, not as like, I do. Yeah. Like in, in like game design school, it's like you can never do this because you're not Richard Garfield. Yeah, yeah. I think this whole game falls into that category in some ways. Yeah. But okay, those camp cards. So camp cards are interest. I, I want to talk about camps and provisions at the same time. Okay. Okay. Because this let you is talk another about it this time. But I do okay. want this flag for us, Brendan. We what? should like do an Wrap episode at some. No, oh, okay. no, no. Do an episode some point on like shit that like famous game designers get away with that nobody else could <laughs> okay great because we're gonna like, talk I about know, like what's like the the reiner knizzi example of the Blue Lagoon. card if you went to a publisher and you were like yeah here's my scoring sheet and it has 
Okay, let's talk about camps. So camps and provisions. Camp cards say claim a territory in, on the board anywhere that's open until someone else claims it, so long as it doesn't have a city. And then provision cards say f- just randomly take two cards from the deck and those you get those cards. So what do you think of these cards, Jake, and how do you value them? Uh, I take provisions like super early. What? <laughs> Almost every time. Oh my gosh. Especially, or especially if it's like... I think like pack one, pick one for me. No. Pack yeah. One, pick one? Why not? <laughs> I get a whole extra card. But the card could be worthless. Well, How, not in what pack percentage one, of the time one. is that worthless? I think that is like going to my ethos of like all these cards are like so balanced. Like I might as well just have more of them, <laughs> especially early on. Okay. Like I'm what probably not going to pick it over something that's like objectively worth a lot of points for me in pack three. Yeah. But. I might. No, I, I completely know what you're saying. Wait, pack three? I was about to be like, I completely understand what you're saying. Pack one, they can be pretty good because you can get, yeah. you get a little bit of value and you card advantage and then you can build around it, but they taper off. You're picking them in pack three? No, I mean, I might. I might, Brendan. <laughs> Because I, I, like, I have more information, right? So they're, sure. like, there it could be like the deck is loaded in my favor. Sure, or it's worthless. Yeah. Or it's worthless and I don't take it. I agree, but I, provisions for me are a really interesting design decision because they're the, the epitome of this fuzziness ethos where you know there's some value to what you're doing, but you don't exactly know what it will pay off. So how do you value something that's just random? But it works. So funny. Because it's, it's just like it's a great. perfect dichotomy between like your like everything is fuzzy. Like, not for me. Pack one, pick one, baby. <laughs> Every time. Okay, wait. Okay. That's you the extra take- card. Provisions or gold? What do you take? Pack one, pick one? Yeah. Provisions, a hundred percent. Brent, will you go <laughs> get out? What's your go to board game arena? Will you tell me what your average score is this game? I just want to know if you're just like way, way better than me at this no, game. No, there's no way. I'm way better. Okay, while we're going, what do you think of camps? I don't like camps. I take camps like very late. Yeah. They're situational, right? Like they're like pack three, obviously. They're can be okay if you have something that you need to to go into but uh i mean i I think they're i think generally it's a late pack card for me you could have a fife set up in a way that even scoring something once could be getting you a bonus of like three points and maybe there's a chance you get to score it twice or even three times if you're really lucky so they there can be like really big upside to camps but generally i think my like more conservative nature of playing games just doesn't like the idea that like okay but somebody could just be swooping Snatch that it up. Away, uh, and i could be instead be getting something that i can more bank my strategy on over the next I, few rounds i agree i i think camps are a late pick at best and just not super great where do i see i'm in my stats jake where do i see my average score where is it in the list stats I don't want to reveal my number until I reveal your number, but I will say my my scores have skyrocketed lately. In my last few games, my last five games, Brendan, yeah, one forty four, one forty nine, one fifty three, one eleven, one fifty. That's good. Wow, that is good. Yeah, so provisions, pretty dang good, huh? I guarantee I took more provisions than anybody else in those games. Uh, okay, what do you say your average score is? Should we say it on three, and then the listeners won't be able to tell the difference between what we say? Okay. Yeah, three, two, one. One twenty-one point seven. Point seven. No way! <laughs> you know, that was... Wait, <laughs> are you looking at my score? <laughs> 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 oh my god! Oh my. <laughs> 129.6 dang it okay okay great oh my gosh we got there but you've you've gotten further from your like starting game where you just suck like my first few plays are all in the 80s because i just didn't understand what i was doing what's your highest score ever do you know i think maybe 156 156 that's really good i think my highest score ever was 250 something but i've seen someone jim and our discord score 278 points at this game what but that's in a three-player game jake okay, but, okay right so there's gonna, more points how is that possible <laughs> there's more points in the pie being split cl- okay yeah all right okay so that's also skewing your score up brendan because mine are all four player games so you're probably a little higher i had 233 in a four player game one time wow nice that's, that's pretty yeah, yeah. okay anyway this is so anecdotal and not what our listeners need to hear that was great <laughs> just a bunny kingdom you- measuring contest <laughs> 
I think it's a carrot measuring contest, right? <laughs> that's better. That's a way <laughs> yeah. better joke. Yeah. <laughs> Do you have... Okay, let's say this wasn't a drafting game built on this core idea of you you have to stay open and play what comes to your seat. What's sort of your favorite strategy to play in this game? Like, what do you want to do? Do you just want to build a big old fife and score 90 points on the fife? Like, 20 points, 10 points round one, 30 points round two, 50, just like snowball. What do you want to do? Do you just want to snatch up all the apartments, double your treasures? Like what's the, what's the, yeah. Difference? Yeah. I think probably leaning more toward, I, I, I think, I guess I would say like my ideal thing is like pack one, pick one. I get like a part double that privileges I can just, that I can just, yeah, hell yeah. And then we just <laughs> ride, dude. <laughs> no, but. Uh, I, I think like, you know, kind of the line you were talking about being like the forest, like outside the oh, board sure. strategy or, you know, I, I, I was getting like a bunch of points in a recent game by just like having territories that didn't have anything in them. Mm. Um, oh, from like one the barbarian. Think, yeah. Or something like that. Which is yeah. like if you have a territory that's not worth any point points. or it doesn't it doesn't have any like building in it. Or something. Yeah. Or and then also I was having the one that's like points for outside the board and maybe mm. something else too. So like I could just like have a territory with like nothing in it that was just like four points. But that felt really cool. So I, I like I like doing that, like just trying to like kind of follow a path. I do think cards like that are part of what contributes to the feeling that you have, Jake, that everything's so balanced. These cards that sort of say, This is normally terrible, but if you get this card, it's good. You yeah, know? I right. think that's why it kind of feels that way. Yeah. My favorite strategy, I think my ideal way to play is I want a really small fife that scores a ton of points. So it's nothing's wasted. There's no empty spaces. All the resources and everyone that's not a resource that's a luxury good has a city in it on top of it, right? Just like super small. And then I want on top of that, every treasure in the game with both the treasure parchments. So it's just like double your points from treasures and then three points for each treasure. That's like my dream play because i i find that players don't really often i don't value the treasure highly usually like yeah. if okay i grab the the royal the royal cloak it's two points i don't care i don't right. want it like so i find that those are interesting if i can build a strategy around cards i'm likely to get past that feels fun and then even the little things like the left and right glove people aren't going to take those unless they're playing treasure but if there's someone else at the table playing treasure obviously i want nothing to do with it garbage yeah and the fact right. that there's two build around me treasure parchments means that oftentimes there's going to be two people at the table interested in treasure and then that's way less interesting so i really only like to do this if i crack one of those parchments early on and can kind of try to cut treasure and i'm not passing it to give any signs that treasure is open because it's not it's all mine yeah okay sure. what about sky towers do you think sky towers are good i i think my estimation of them is like decreasing mm. the more i play the game like yeah. They definitely can be helpful, like helpful utility, but it's not something I'm taking early because you would rather not have to take a sky tower. You would right. rather have a fife that has what it needs without play, without having to draft a sky a sky tower. Because if you're drafting a sky tower, you're not drafting something else like a city that could give you points or getting connected to a new resource. So in general, sky towers are a parachute, not something to build around. Is how I feel. Yeah. Yeah, it could be good. I think, I mean, there are a lot of like little mini synergies happening here, right? So, sure. like, the sky towers could be really good connecting with the to parchment mountains. that sure. like wants you to get lots of cities. Sure. Right. And then all of a sudden, now like all your cities are going to be connected to. Yeah. Or if your fife doesn't connect to any so. mountains, but you, you know, you crack a bunch of the cities that score three, but they have to be in mountains. All of a sudden, sky towers right. get way better because you need to find a connection to the mountains. So, right. That exactly. could be your way. Yeah, so they're they're a utility card, but yeah, situational. Sure. I think that the number of I said that the card pool wasn't that deep here, and I think that I still feel that way. And part of that is because the card design is so elegant. A lot yeah, of the card it pool really is, is good. Yeah, it's made up of cards of the same type. So, and what I mean by that is the majority of the deck is territories, a hundred territory cards. So then you're, and then from that, you're looking at a subset of the deck is treasures and the treasures are easy to understand. Those are flat points. And then there, the, there's parchments. Okay. I can understand those parchments make me want to do things. That's where a lot of the depth comes in. And then there's just like a few other card types, luxury goods. Well, those are printed on the board. So it's for other types of resources. So I can understand those fairly easily. Then there's sky towers, camps and provisions. And that's kind of the whole, the whole rub. But from that sort of elegant set of types of cards, because they're all sort of related, it's easier to grok than they might be of a game with that many different types of 
different cards. I don't know. I think the card, the deck design is really good in Money Kingdom. Yeah, it. I think that's why it's big enough that your first couple plays are going to be a, a little bit intimidating or rough or whatever, yeah. just because there's a lot of stuff. And even as intuitive as it seems now, when you're kind of thinking about, okay, like the, okay, territory score, like what's a fife? Like what is a castle? Sure. Like that's a that's something I'm still kind of like clicking on on board game arena. Like okay, wait, the castle that's the actual towers that I have. Okay, or whatever. So like the way things score can be a little bit confusing. Mm-hmm. Just like ha- and you really need to have that internalized when you're making drafting decisions. Like you're, you're gonna have a bad time if you're like, we'll just see what happens after the first round of scoring <laughs> or whatever. Uh, you're like, oh yeah. crap, I haven't been. I've got a bunch of fish over here. <laughs> totally no totally yeah so it right so like the the way yes a luxury good is easy to understand a castle is easy to understand the sky towers are easy to understand but like the way it actually like comes together to result in getting points or not points there's a pretty big learning curve there i think maybe even deceptively high for like kind of the fun art um but what the intuitive card design gets you is that it only takes two plays and you're like up and running uh whereas a much more you know complex game or like a less elegantly designed game would would take five six seven plays yeah agreed i the final thing i want to touch on jake and this can kind of be my closing thoughts if that's okay is just player count i think one of the things that does hold bunny kingdom back is it's a game that it's really kind of a three to four player game um it's a drafting game that doesn't accommodate five and a lot of these games try to typically and it at two players it's there's this variant where every turn you're drafting a card, but and then you're discarding a card rather than drafting two. Um, so you get information of what's not in the card pool. And I think that it just, that changes the feel. I've only played it that way once or twice, I think, and it changes the feel quite a bit. I At four, the game is a little bit tenser, a little bit harsher, uh, where you're you're competing for the limited pool of resources a little bit more. Um, and cards are wheeling less often because there's just, functionally there's one more stop on the way to get back to you so fewer packs are going to make it as far around um at three players the game's a little bit looser there's physically more territory to be shared by every player your percentage share of the luxury goods or of the treasure or the parchments just is higher um so so the pie is split a little bit i would say it It's just the competition isn't as harsh, but that means you're usually scoring more, which can feel good. And I do like that you're wheeling more cards. Uh, That helps the decision space. I like it equally at three and four for different reasons. I think they're both good versions of Bunny Kingdom. Yeah, cool, man. I I think I'll kind of like end with Richard Garfield's thoughts where like Bunny Kingdom ultimately maybe isn't a game that like I love. It's not really one I want to pick up to play physically or you know, really go out of my way to play more. But that's one I'm really glad that I'm tried and I learned about just because the the way drafting is implemented here with the board is so interesting. I don't regret my plays at all, at all. And I'll definitely, you know, continue to enjoy a quick casual game on Board Game Arena. Uh, so I'd recommend other people check it out in that format as well. Uh, and, you know, overstate it or not, it's really nice that Board Game Arena cuts through all that scoring for you at the end of the game and makes it instantaneous. Yeah, absolutely. Um, And I think for me, Bunny Kingdom is just something that I wish there was more of. I wish it was more popular so there were uh, more parchments to add in or or parchment packs to swap in with different boards you could play on. Um, and it's definitely one that I would love to to try out the expansion for. I think it adds another board, actually, which is kind of cool. It doesn't add a different board. It adds another board um, in the sky. So uh, one day I want to go sky high with Bunny Kingdom. But until then, um, I'm excited to hear what our listeners think of the of everything that we've discussed on the show. What are your favorite strategies? What strategies do you think are kind of bunk? What do you, does the game work for you? Do you find it frustrating? Come into our discord. You can find a link to it in our show notes below or on decisionspacepodcast.com. We'd love to hear from you. All right. Well, thank you all so much. And we should also thank Hembry for our intro and outro music. Reach out. We'll see you next week. Bye. Bye y'all. Oh,